Okay, on behalf of the board and staff, I welcome you to the Tulsa County Free Library and tonight's presentation, Marriage, Metaphor, and Mortality, The Poetry of Jane Kenyon by Sue Ellen Thompson. Before I introduce Sue Ellen, a couple of housekeeping announcements. First, and most important, bathrooms. <laughs> Should the need arise, you will find our bathrooms out in the lobby on your right. Number two, and nearly as important, I'd like to ask you now to please turn off or silence your cell phones. Thank you. And now it gives me great pleasure to introduce tonight's speaker, Sue Ellen Thompson. <laughs> Sue Ellen is the author of five books of poetry and the editor of a major anthology of contemporary American poetry. She has taught at Middlebury, Wesleyan, Central Connecticut State University, Binghamton University, and the University of Delaware, among others. At last count, I think I have this right, nine of her poems have been read on air by Garrison Keillor on his The Writer's Almanac, the NPR radio show. They have been featured in the Pushcart Prize and Best American Poetry Anthologies. Tonight, in our library, we will have not one, but two great poets in the room, Jane Kenyon and Sue Ellen Thompson. But Sue Ellen is more than just a great poet. She is a generous poet. Since moving here, I have watched her help countless poets try their wings. Her encouragement, her support, have meant, has meant everything to many young writers, and old writers, and I'm thinking about me here. In a lecture, I once heard Sue Ellen tell a sad story about Robert Frost publicly humiliating a young poet. When it happened, someone had the presence of mind to turn to Frost and say, in what I hope was a very loud voice, you know, you may be a great poet, but you are a bad man. Oh, wow. Ladies and gentlemen, it gives me great pleasure to introduce a great poet and a great woman. Thank you, Bill. Is the a level of illumination about right? Can you see the slides? Okay. I've heard it down yeah, maybe turn it down just a little bit. <laughs> Is that better? Boy, that's a little, that's maybe a little not enough for quite enough for me. <laughs> My glasses. The slide is pretty tiny. Yeah. <laughs> okay, is that about right? All right, that's good. Thank you. Thank you, Bill. Thank you, Talbot County Library, for, for sponsoring this lecture. Um, I can't remember the first time I read a poem by Jane Kenyon. But given the fact that she wasn't much older than I was, and that we both published our first books with Boston-based publishers, I'm guessing that I might first have come across her work at um, the famous Grolier Bookshop, which is not far from Harvard Square, in the late, probably the late 1980s. <coughs> but the truth is, I don't remember how or when her work entered my consciousness. It was as if it had always been there. My parents, who had retired to New Hampshire in 1984, were living in Canterbury, barely half an hour from Wilmot, where Kenyon and her husband, the older and much more widely known poet, Donald Hall, lived. I would drive right past their road every time I made the trip from my parents' house to my little cottage in Vermont, and I never had the nerve to call ahead and ask if I could stop and introduce myself. I occasionally saw the columns that Kenyon wrote for the Concord Monitor, which was the newspaper my parents devoured over breakfast every morning. And my mother would faithfully clip any articles having to do with poets or poetry, many of which featured New Hampshire's favorite poetry couple, and leave them on the night table in the room where I slept. But I was just beginning to think of myself as a poet back then, and I simply didn't have the confidence to even drive past their house, and it was my loss. 
Jane Kenyon was born in May 1947 in Ann Arbor, Michigan. Her parents were not the typical young post-war couple my own parents had been, eager to buy a house and establish a secure financial future from which to raise a family. Her father had spent the 1920s playing jazz piano in Europe, and he met her mother during World War II when he was performing with a dance band at a Detroit hotel, and she was a singer in the hotel bar. When Jane and her older brother were born, their mother gave up her singing career and became a seamstress. Her father played piano for a Dixieland band and gave lessons on the side. In other words, she grew up in a house where music was more important than money. Although she lived in Ann Arbor, Kenyon's childhood home was surrounded by farms and orchards. Many years later, she would tell an interviewer, I spent long hours playing at the stream that ran through my family's property. We lived on a dirt road near the Huron River, across from a working farm. I fell in love with the natural world. I use it again and again as a way of talking about something inward. The very few biographical sources about Kenyon uh, tend to skip over her high school years, and perhaps for good reason. She was overweight, she wore thick glasses, and she was never in the running for prom queen. <laughs> like so many young people who are drawn to poetry at that age, and I would certainly count myself among them, um, Kenyon's life as a poet didn't really begin until she went to college. As a French major at the University of Michigan, she enrolled in a course called Introduction to Poetry for Non-English Majors, taught by the poet Donald Hall. She had been writing poems since junior high school, but it was this class that transformed her love of poetry into something more serious. What Don did, she once explained, was to instill an appreciation of poetry line by line, word by word. She wanted to take Hall's creative writing workshop the following year, but enrollment was strictly limited and she had to submit a group of five poems to get in. Every young poet writes a grandmother poem, Hall later said. Jane's was not generic. She got in. <laughs> at this point in his career, Donald Hall was a tenured professor at the university and the author of four books of poetry as well as a respected anthology, which he, he co-edited with my first poetry mentor at Middlebury College, Robert Pack. He was 19 years older than Kenyon, which would make him a little over 40, recently divorced with two young children. But after having her in his poetry workshop and occasionally meeting with her in his office to discuss her poems, he and Kenyon became what she later described as good friends, something more than teacher and student, but not romantic. Kenyon was actually in the process of breaking up with a boyfriend and was quite miserable. So Hall started taking her out for dinner once a week to cheer her up, and over time they became close. It was during her college years that Kenyon first exhibited symptoms of depression, a disease she had inherited from her father. She sought medical help, but this was in the early 1970s, and it would be more than 10 years before she received a proper diagnosis and medication. Hall was aware of her struggle and went so far as to introduce her to someone who would provide her with therapy at an affordable price, but that didn't cure her. Kenyon graduated with her BA in 1970 and went on to complete an MA in 72, by which time she and Hall had fallen in love. They were married in April of that year when she was 24 and he was 43. But their former student-teacher relationship haunted their new one as husband and wife. I couldn't criticize her poems, Hall explained, because then I became her teacher. Kenyon felt so daunted by his reputation and presence in the house that she could only write when he was out of town. Hall had a sabbatical coming up in 1975, and they decided to spend it at Eagle Pond Farm in Wilmot, New Hampshire, which had been in his family since 1865. 
and where Hall himself had spent many childhood summers with his grandparents. For Hall, it made complete sense. His grandmother was now in a nursing home, and his mother and her two sisters needed to raise some cash to support her. Because a textbook that he had written was doing well, he had enough money to offer an immediate down payment on the farmhouse and its 152 acres. Before long, his grandmother had died and the farm was his. It felt like a homecoming for both of them. Hall, because he had so much family history there, and Kenyon, because it reminded her of the rural outskirts of Ann Arbor. But now she had whole days to fill and felt a certain pressure to justify her new existence as the wife of a well-known poet. I used to work only when the spirit moved, she said, but now she began writing every day. Kenyon's and Hall's poems were very different. Hall was writing what a friend described as large, ambitious, loose-limbed poems, while Kenyon was entirely focused on writing lyric poetry, which she described as short, intense, musical cries of the spirit. He was impatient and energetic, while she was prone to depression and periods of lethargy. But they soon established a comfortable daily routine that Hall referred to as a double solitude. Each had a separate room in which to work, and mid-morning they would meet for coffee in the kitchen and exchange a few words before returning to their desks. By the end of this sabbatical year, neither of them wanted to go back to Ann Arbor. Hall had discovered a sense of wholeness in returning to New Hampshire, and Kenyon said she would chain herself to the walls of the root cellar rather than move back to Michigan. <laughs> so Hall, who at this point had two children in or about to start college, uh, resigned his tenured teaching post. They moved permanently to Eagle Pond Farm where he hoped to make a living as a poet and freelance writer. Once she'd settled into her new life at the farm, Kenyon's daily routine rarely varied. She would rise early, take her dog Gus for a walk, do some household chores, eat breakfast, and then go up the back stairs off the kitchen that led to her study, where she would spend the rest of the morning working on poems. After a break for lunch with Hall, she would return to her study. If the poetry wasn't going well, she would take up her chores again, or if the weather were good, work in the garden. When revising a poem, she would eventually reach a point where she wanted to show it to Hall. If she thought the poem was finished, she wanted his stamp of approval. If not, then she wanted his suggestions for how and where it might be improved. In return, she did the same for him. It may sound easy and comfortable, but they did not always like each other's work. Rather than being confrontational, they carried politeness to an extreme. <laughs> Hall might read one of her poems and say, this is going to be good, to which Kenyon would respond, going to be? <laughs> Sometimes she would find herself climbing the stairs back up to her study after one of their joint feedback sessions and thinking, he just doesn't get it. The next day, she would take another look at his suggestions and decide, why don't I just type it up that way and see how it looks? At which point she would find herself agreeing with him. For his part, Hall remembers watching Kenyon once as she read through his manuscript with tears in her eyes, saying, Perkins, I don't like it. Uh, Perkins was the nickname she gave to him, probably part of the process of putting some distance between herself and her former teacher. He wept as well, saying, it's all right, it's all right. By 1978, she had published her first book, From Room to Room, with Alice James Press in Boston. Soon she began meeting a few times a year with two other Alice James authors, Joyce Pezeroff of Massachusetts and Alice Madison, who lived in Connecticut. Now here they are later on in their lives. She referred to them as the committee, and it was on these two women that she relied for honest feedback. 
when Madison, a prolific writer, was too quick to submit her work for publication rather than waiting for Jane and Joyce's opinions. Kenyon would gently advise her, let it grow in the dark like a mushroom and don't pick it too soon. This is another picture of Jane with Alice Madison, who is the one with her back turned. But she was still married to a far more famous poet, and it bothered her when she was treated like the little wife who wrote poetry on the side. When a New Hampshire high school, inviting her to participate in their young authors program, opened their letter with, Dear Mrs. Hall, Kenyon said to Pezeroff and Madison, shall I kill them or just say I'm busy? <laughs> and when she accompanied Hall to Yale for a joint reading and the deputy director of the summer school fawned over her husband before turning to her politely and asking, and how are you? She responded flatly, pre-menstrual. <laughs> Finally, when an English professor asked her if she ever felt dwarfed by her husband's reputation, she decided they should no longer give joint readings. This arrangement lasted until the late 1980s when they did a joint Q&A at a university and the students directed most of their questions to her, not him. Perkins, she said, I think we can read together now. <laughs> Kenyon's first extended period of depression occurred after they had been married about 10 years. She had just finished her training as a hospice volunteer and was about to take on her first case when the news arrived from Ann Arbor that her father was dying of lung cancer. She returned to Michigan for the last six months of his life. When he died, she lost not just her father, but as Hall explains it, the object of her concentrated care. Paul describes the impact this had on her. In 1982, six months after the death, we drank a beer one night in the small town of Bristol. As we drove back, Jane sank under a torment and torrent of wild crying. At home, she curled on the sofa in a fetal position and wept for three days. I wanted to hold and comfort her, as I had done earlier when she was low, but now I could not touch her. If I touched her, she would want to scream. Hall took her to the head of psychiatry at Dartmouth-Hitchcock Hospital, where she was diagnosed with bipolar disorder. A variety of medications were prescribed, and she was on one or the other of them for the rest of her life. In 1984, after a manic episode, she took lithium, which put an end to her mania, but dulled her creativity. Nardal relieved her depression, but caused terrible insomnia. She had the most success with doxepin, which got her through three whole years without a major depression. But her body built up a tolerance to it, which meant taking increasingly larger and eventually unsafe doses. Uh, she talks about her struggle to find the right medication um, in one part of this nine-part poem you can find online <clears throat> called Having It Out with Melancholy. Her depressive periods were, it seems, quite extreme. Hall once found her banging her head against the bathroom floor, and another time, after driving herself home from Concord, she confessed that she had felt the impulse to drive off the road. She also fantasized about hanging herself with a horse's harness. But medication kept her from carrying through on these thoughts. During her manic periods, which were less common, she would become uncharacteristically extravagant and decisive. Frugal Jane had to buy a peridot ring, Hall recounts. Indecisive Jane, who always asked me to make choices, what restaurant to go to, which night to see the play, what book to read aloud, knew exactly what we should do. I thought, I'm married to someone I don't know. During what would turn out to be her last extended manic episode, Kenyon wrote an opera libretto, which her husband <coughs> describes as best forgotten, in two and a half days. But the drugs were working, and her manic periods after this became much briefer, some of them little more than flashes. Then, in 1985, she discovered a lump on her neck it turned out to be a cancerous salivary gland, which required surgery. Although she was only 38, 
this was the first in a series of medical crises that would come to define her marriage to Hall. A pivotal event of a much happier sort occurred in the late 1970s, not long after the publication of Kenyon's first book. Robert Bly, a poet who had been a friend of Hall's and had often visited his class at the University of Michigan, some of you may be familiar with that name, came to New Hampshire to see him in his new environment. According to Kenyon, I showed him some poems that I had been working on, and he read them thoughtfully, then looked up and said, it's time for you now to take a writer and work with that writer as a master. I wasn't even sure what he meant, but I said, I can't have a man as a master. And he said, without missing a beat, then read Akhmatova. Anna Akhmatova, who had died in 1966, was one of Russia's most acclaimed poets. She wrote during the Stalinist period, and as a result, her work was censored, her first husband executed, and her son was put in prison. Like Kenyon, she wrote from an emotionally dark place, but for personal and political, rather than mental health reasons. And like Kenyon's, her work was characterized by economy and emotional restraint. Kenyon immediately began collecting all the translations of Akhmatova's work she could find. She didn't like most of them, describing them as word games that were more interested in preserving some semblance of the original Russian rhyme and meter than they were in reproducing Akhmatova's precise images. So she began trying to come up with her own, focusing on imagery rather than form. For example, Akhmatova has a poem about a woman parting from her lover with whom she has had an argument. In Kenyon's translation, the speaker says, the glove that belongs on my right hand, I put on my left. As Kenyon later explained, can't you just see this flustered, red-faced, confused, frightened woman with a wild look on her face? It's all there in that image. For those of you who aren't familiar with how translation works, um, this is how it's usually done. Vera Sandomirsky Dunham, who was a Russian scholar uh, living on Long Island with whom Robert Bly had worked in the past, would provide Kenyon with literal free verse translations of Akhmatova's poems. Then Kenyon struggled to turn that English version back into poetry, and in doing so, she placed the integrity of the image above all other considerations. If it was an exercise, as Kenyon later claimed, it was an inspiring one. After working intensely on Akhmatova's poem, she said, I began to feel some power in my own work for the first time. From Akhmatova, Kenyon learned, in the words of Ezra Pound, the natural object is always the adequate symbol. If she could come up with the right natural object, it could embody the exact emotion she wanted to convey. It could be an owl landing on a snow-laden tree branch or a thimble found on a woodshed floor. In 1985, she published a book of translations called 20 Poems of Anna Akhmatova. These were eventually included both in her volume of collected poems and in 100 White Daffodils which is a collection of essays, interviews, and newspaper columns. But despite the effort she put into her Akhmatova project, Kenyon's ongoing depression made it difficult to believe in herself and her work. In a letter to her friend Alice Madison, she wrote, I went to Ann Arbor, helped my mother, put on a yard sale, came home, and wrote a poem called Yard Sale, Boredom. <laughs> On another occasion, she wrote, I've drafted three shallow poems in three days. And on another, my ear is not working, my poetry ear. I can't write a line that doesn't sound like pots and pans falling out of the cupboard. When one of her poems was chosen for the Best American Poetry Series in 1989, she dismissed it as being no more than memory and reportage. And when the editor of a prestigious literary magazine accepted another of her poems, she claimed that the only reason he'd done so was because he'd had lunch with her husband, even though that lunch had occurred 
13 years earlier. <laughs> she also had a capacity for guilt that Madison, her friend, called legendary. For example, if you look at the short poem on your handout called Biscuit. The dog has cleaned his bowl, and his reward is a biscuit, which I put in his mouth like a priest offering the host. I can't bear that trusting face. He asks for bread, expects bread, and I, in my power, might have given him a stone. The guilt she experiences when confronted with her dog's trust is clear. But as Alice Madison later pointed out, Gus loved chewing stones. <laughs> Spirituality also began to play a part in Kenyon's work. Shortly after settling at Eagle Pond Farm, Hall suggested they might go to the church in South Danbury, where his, uh, which his ancestors had founded. Kenyon was taken aback. She had not been raised in a religious household. And her first reaction was, oh no, stockings and a skirt. <laughs> but Hall presented it as more of a social obligation. And Jack Jensen, the preacher, won them both over when he quoted the poet Rilke in his sermon. Soon they were regulars, and the experience began to change her poetry. Not long after the Akhmatova translations were published, Kenyon's second book came out. This was in 1986, when she was 39 years old. One of the best known poems from this volume, Evening at a Country Inn, provides an excellent example of Kenyon's belief in the primacy of the image. It was written after Hall's son, Andrew, was involved in a car accident. It's on your handout. Evening at a Country Inn. From here, I see a single red cloud impaled on the town hall weather vane. Now the horses are back in their stalls, and the dogs are nowhere in sight that made them run and buck in the brittle morning light. You laughed only once all day, when the cat ate cucumbers in Chekhov's story, and now you smoke and pace the long hallway downstairs. The cook is roasting meat for the evening meal, and the smell rises to all the rooms. Red-faced skiers stamp past you on their way in. Their hunger is Homeric. I know you were thinking of the accident, of picking the slivered glass from his hair. Just now, a truck loaded with hay stopped at the village store to get gas. I wish you would look at the hay, the beautiful, sane, and solid bales of hay. Here again, it is the natural object, a single red cloud impaled on the town hall weather vane, along with the bucking horses and the smell of meat that prepares us for news of the accident. But it is really the beautiful, sane, and solid bales of hay at the end that carry the weight of Kenyon's heartfelt wish for her husband's peace of mind. A number of poems in The Boat of Quiet Hours reveal a growing awareness of Kenyon's depression. Um, I'd like to take a quick look at just two of these. First, um, the aptly named Depression in Winter. There comes a little space between the south side of a boulder and the snow that fills the woods around it. <coughs> Sun heats the stone, reveals a crescent of bare ground, brown ferns, and tufts of needles like red hair, acorns, a patch of moss, bright green. I sank with every step up to my knees, throwing myself forward with a violence of effort, greedy for unhappiness, until by accident, I found the stone with its secret porch of heat and light where something small could luxuriate, then turn back down my path, chastened and calm. This is actually one of the more hopeful poems in this volume. There is that secret porch of heat and light where something small could luxuriate that rescues her from her headlong rush toward unhappiness and sends her back down the path, chastened and calm. But in this poem, the natural object, the boulder, expands into an entire house 
with a front porch, a patch of bright green moss for a lawn, and colorful gardens filled with ferns and pine needles. She stumbles upon it by accident in the midst of a depressive episode, and it saves her, just as poetry so often did in her life. Now let's take a look at Things, which is the last poem in the book. The hen flings a single pebble aside with her yellow reptilian foot. Never in eternity the same sound, a small stone falling on a red leaf. The juncture of twig and branch, scarred with lichen, is a gate we might enter, singing. The mouse pulls batting from a hundred-year-old quilt. She chewed a hole in a blue star to get it, and now she thrives. Now is her time to thrive. Things, simply lasting, then failing to last. Water, a blue heron's eye, and the light passing between them. Into light, all things must fall, glad at last to have fallen. It's not just the natural object, a small stone falling on a red leaf, but the sound it makes that embodies the task of the poet, which is to find the words to capture the momentary. It is also the poet's task to examine the natural world so closely that even its most minute and easily overlooked details, the place where twig and branch join and then diverge, become portals through which we can enter a kind of heaven, a world beyond the literal. But as a poet myself, I can only imagine how thrilled Kenyon must have been to come up with that image of a mouse chewing a hole in a blue star in a hundred-year-old quilt. This is the perfect metaphor for what Kenyon herself struggled to do. If poetry was what she wanted, she had to fight her way through her own depression to get to it. She had to reach beyond it to find something that would shelter and sustain her, at the same time knowing that one day her struggle would end and she too would be glad at last to have fallen. The writer Wendell Berry, whose name I'm sure will be familiar to many of you, counts this poem among his favorites. Jane Kenyon's work, he says, doesn't demand great intellect or learning or even sympathy. It demands quiet. It demands that in this age of political, economical, educational, and recreational pandemonium, one must somehow become quiet enough to listen. Kenyon's next book, Let Evening Come, came out four years later, 1990. By this time, there was another disturbance in the calm at Eagle Pond Farm. Donald Hall's discovery in 1989 that he had colon cancer. Her own brush with cancer five years earlier had not been entirely forgotten, but this was far more serious, especially when it metastasized to his liver two years later. He was now in his early 60s, and colleges and universities began holding what amounted to memorial services for him. He had surgery to remove a portion of his liver, and the chemotherapy that followed made it difficult for him to keep up with his busy schedule of travel and readings. However, against all odds, he managed to survive and regain his strength. The title poem of Let Evening Come, Kenyon later confessed, was written quickly. While I was in Ann Arbor, she wrote Alice Madison, I heard my mother say, let evening come. We were talking about getting depressed as the day goes on and wanting bedtime to come so you could go to bed early and become oblivious. I think let evening come is going to be my title. And you have that on the next page. Let the light of late afternoon shine through cheeks in the barn, moving up the veils as the sun moves down. Let the cricket take up chafing as a woman takes up her needles and her yarn. Let evening come. Let dew collect on the hoe abandoned in long grass. 
Let the stars appear and the moon disclose her silver horn. Let the fox go back to its sandy den. Let the wind die down. Let the shed go black inside. Let evening come. To the bottle in the ditch, to the scoop in the oats, to air in the lung, let evening come. Let it come as it will, and don't be afraid. God does not leave us comfortless, so let evening come. There's something soothing and consoling in that repeated phrase, something that imposes a sense of order and acceptance on what we might otherwise be temple, uh, tempted to struggle against. Perhaps this is why this poem is so often read at funerals and memorial services. Although, as Donald Hall is quick to point out, those who translate evening immediately into death are missing the poem's point. There is peace, she is saying, whether the light rises or falls. The early 90s were, in the words of the poet Liam Rector, the years of triumph for Hall and Kenyon. Bill Moyer's hour-long documentary about the couple, A Life Together, uh, which you can see on his website and also on YouTube. You can watch the whole thing. It's about an, about an hour long. Was broadcast on public television and received an Emmy Award. Hall and Kenyon were also invited to the well-known Geraldine R. Dodge Poetry Festival in New Jersey, where they were greeted as celebrities and where they performed together, which was now their habit. The Boston Globe and literary magazines featured articles about their poetry partnership, and at the invitation of the State Department, they toured India together. Let Evening Come was followed in 1993 by Constance, Kenyon's fourth book. I can remember assigning that to my students at Central Connecticut State University when it first came out. It was in Constance that depression emerged as a major theme, causing some critics to compare her work to that of Sylvia Plath. But Kenyon's poems, as we've already seen, were reserved, while Plath's hovered on the verge of hysteria. They might have suffered from related mental health issues, but their responses as poets could not have been more different. The return of Hall's cancer turned out to be merely the warning shot. Barely two months after Moyer's documentary was aired on PBS in late 1993, Liam Rector invited Kenyon to visit the writing seminars at Bennington College, which he directed. Because teaching terrified Kenyon, she was told she could do whatever she wanted. Instead of conducting workshops, she did readings and lectures on Elizabeth Bishop, Anna Akhmatova, and John Keats. There was not a dry eye in the place, Re Rector later recalled. She simply read the poems beautifully, slowly, and talked about what they meant to her. After her final Bennington reading, Kenyon told Rector she was feeling tired. She had a cold, and by the time she got home, thought she might be coming down with the flu. Hall, meanwhile, was at a conference in South Carolina. He checked in with her by phone twice a day, and was concerned when she complained of what she described as bone pain, as well as a nosebleed that landed her in the emergency room. She was still awaiting the results of her blood work, but Hall was already on high alert. He heard the words flu symptoms, nosebleed, and blood work, and immediately thought leukemia. Kenyon picked up on the anxiety in his voice and began to feel frightened herself after hanging up, she called a neighbor and asked her to come over for tea. The doctor called while the neighbor was still there. He told Kenyon to go immediately to Dartmouth-Hitchcock Hospital, where he had a room waiting for her. Hall, who was on his way home from the airport when he decided to make a quick stop at the hospital in New London, New Hampshire, to visit his mother, was sitting at her bedside when Kenyon's doctor called to say that Jane had ALL, that's acute lymphoblastic leukemia, the kind children typically get and from which they frequently recover, but the prognosis for a 46-year-old woman was not nearly as optimistic. Mm -hmm. Their peaceful routine at Eagle Pond 
farm was rudely disrupted. That's actually Eagle Pond. Quote, now the schedule was nausea and dread, elevators and cafeteria boredom and panic, and occasionally relief, Hall remembers. He rented a room at a nearby Days Inn so he could run to the hospital every morning, taking periodic breaks to visit his mother in the New London Hospital some miles away. One morning, he found Kenyon wide awake and unusually restless. Using a walker, she was able to take a short stroll with him to the double door that led from the hospital to the winter day outside. Hall noted, like an animal, Jane sniffed the fresh cold air of the world. Polly Kenyon, Jane's mother, had already moved from Michigan to New Hampshire to be near her daughter, and now she volunteered to house sit and care for their pets. Despite how ill she felt, Kenyon still managed flashes of grim humor, like this one duly recorded in her notebook. In the shower this morning, fists full of my hair, looks as if a deathly battle between two minks had occurred. <laughs> <coughs> what was left of that dark, luxuriant hair with its wide white streak that her husband had so often praised fell to the floor when she asked the hospital barber to shake her head. It did seem, for a while at least, that she was responding to the chemotherapy. On February 24th, 1994, she was declared to be in remission and discharged. Kenyon and Hall returned to Eagle Pond Farm, although the drugs on which she would remain, in combination with the psychotropic drugs she was already on, triggered periods of mania, delusion, and even psychosis. Prednisone changed her face and body as well. Her legs got thinner, and her face and her upper torso got puffy. Still bald, she looked in the mirror one day and declared, I am Telly Savalas. <laughs> some of you are old enough to get the joke. <laughs> Two months later, Hall's mother died. They were both deluged with messages of hope from their friends and other poets. The letters and cards that Hall hated most were those that tried to reassure him that everything was going to be fine. The writers knew no such thing, he says. They just wanted to change the subject, and there was no other subject. Kenyon had been told that because she possessed something called the Philadelphia chromosome, which does not respond to chemo or radiation, a relapse was likely. That is exactly what happened, and Kenyon re-entered the hospital for more chemo, which weakened her to the point where she could no longer get out of bed. The doctors recommended a bone marrow transplant, but Dartmouth-Hitchcock only did autologous transplants, meaning those that used the patient's own bone marrow. Hers could not be used, so she had to find a donor and a hospital that would perform the procedure. They decided on the Fred C. Hutchinson Cancer Center in Seattle, known as the Hutch. It was a place for hard cases, Hall said, and James was a hard case. By late August, they had found a donor. The Hutch wanted Kenyon to fly out in late September to begin preparing for the procedure. Whatever momentary joy this might have brought her was erased by the news that her mother, Polly, had been diagnosed with lung cancer. It was hoped that she could be treated in Seattle while they were there, but it would take at least three weeks to put Kenyon back in remission before her transplant, and Polly couldn't wait that long to begin her own treatment. So let's just pause for a minute and, and review this um, series of medical events, all of which occurred over a period of eight years. You know, first there was Jane's salivary gland cancer in 1985, then her husband's colon cancer in 1989, followed by the removal of half his liver in 1992. Then Jane was diagnosed with leukemia in 93, the same year as the death of Hall's mother and the diagnosis of Jane Kenyon's mother's lung cancer. And now, in the autumn of that year, she was facing a bone marrow transplant. Remission was achieved, and Hall and Kenyon flew to Seattle here is Hall's description of what their life there was like. 
We lived in an apartment on a street of the city, but our only address was leukemia. We woke and ate breakfast and showered in leukemia. We walked around the block, keeping up our strength in leukemia's neighborhood. We slept in leukemia all night, tossing and turning with unsettling dreams. The news that Polly Kenyon's cancer had spread to her other lung was a blow to their morale. Paul remembers how affected Kenyon was by her mother's struggle. Quote, Jane lay on her back, staring at the ceiling, or curled like a fetus. Her mother's condition carried her into the darkest place, like the old endogenous depression. Later, when she remembered this time, she said, that's when I wanted to die and be with my mother. Although Polly struggled to stay alive long enough to see her daughter return to New Hampshire, she didn't make it. When the phone call came to tell Kenyon that her mother was gone, she said simply, good. She knew how it felt to wish for one's own suffering to end. Kenyon had the transplant in October, and by February 1995 was able to fly home to New Hampshire. Although she was very weak and frail, she was welcomed at the airport by overjoyed friends and family members. Once again, that joy was short-lived. She experienced severe abdominal pain and had to have her gallbladder removed. She lost more weight and her recovery stalled. Although her blood counts looked good for a while, by early April they were rising again and she began to feel bone pain. After more blood work a week later, she and Hall were shown into a private consultation room at Dartmouth-Hitchcock. I have terrible news, the doctor told them. The leukemia is back. Kenyon's only response was, can I die at home? She spent what little time and energy she had left working with Hall to put together a volume of her new and selected poems, which Grey Wolf Press had encouraged her to do and promised to publish. She hadn't really written any new poems since her diagnosis, with one exception, The Sick Wife, which she wrote after returning from Seattle and while recovering from gallbladder surgery. Although she agreed to have it included in this final volume to be titled otherwise, Kenyon did not consider it finished. Hall remembers returning from a basketball game with his son and finding the poem, which his wife had dictated to a visiting friend on the night table. It remained there for the next several days, and she would occasionally ask him to change a word or a phrase. It would be her last poem. It's on your hand. The Sick Wife. The sick wife stayed in the car while he bought a few groceries. Not yet 50, she had learned what it's like not to be able to button a button. It was the middle of the day, and so only mothers with small children or retired couples stepped through the muddy parking lot. Dry cleaning swung and gleamed on hangers in the cars of the prosperous. How easily they moved, with such freedom, even the old and relatively infirm. The windows began to steam up. The cars on either side of her pulled away so briskly that it made her sick at heart. It may not be one of her best poems, but this has all the earmarks of what makes Kenyon's work so memorable. First, that simple motion of which she is no longer capable buttoning a button. Then the dry cleaning, swinging and gleaming on hangers. What better metaphor for the ease with which those in good health move through their days. And those cars on either side pulling away so briskly, isn't that even what close friends often do when one is terminally ill? Kenyon and Hall worked in a frenzy on the manuscript for 11 days. He rarely left her side, and during this period, they also managed to plan her memorial service and write her obituary. When that was finished, Kenyon couldn't help exclaiming, wasn't that fun working together? As Hall later described it, her faculties diminished, disappearing like lights going out on a hillside across the valley. She had recently been appointed Poet Laureate of New Hampshire, and the day before she died, 
she received word that five of her poems would appear in the New Yorker. Then on April 22nd, barely three months after her own mother's death, Jane Kenyon was gone. When I visited my parents in New Hampshire a few weeks later, I found the Concord Monitor waiting on my bedside table. Poet Jane Kenyon dies at her home in Wilmot, the front page headline proclaimed. Obituaries also appeared in the New York Times, the Washington Post, the Boston Globe, and the Philadelphia Inquirer. It would be almost a year before Gus the dog would stop fetching her slippers from the bedroom. Paul, who had expected to die in his 60s, let his hair and beard grow wild. It was right around this time that I first met him um, at a party in Connecticut after his first public reading following Jane's death. Bill Moyer's documentary about Hall and Kenyon <coughs> ends with a shot of Kenyon and Hall walking Gus through a meadow and over a hill as Kenyon reads her poem, Otherwise. Plan your hand out. I got out of bed on two strong legs. It might have been otherwise. I ate cereal, sweet milk, ripe, flawless peach. It might have been otherwise. I took the dog uphill to the birch wood. All morning, I did the work I love. At noon, I lay down with my mate. It might have been otherwise. We ate dinner together at a table with silver candlesticks. It might have been otherwise. I slept in a bed in a room with paintings on the walls and planned another day just like this one. But one day, I know it will be otherwise. She did know. As Kenyon often pointed out when talking about that final shot in the Moyers documentary, it was her head that disappeared behind the hill first. On their joint headstone in the Proctor Cemetery in Andover, New Hampshire, are the lines she wrote in 1992 when her husband was so ill. I believe in the miracles of art, but what prodigy will keep you safe beside me? This is a, a line from her poem, Afternoon at McDowell. The purpose of poetry, Kenyon once said, was to tell the entire truth about what it is to be alive. She said, poetry has an earthly ability to turn suffering into beauty. She went on to explain that the poet has to console in the face of the inevitable disintegration of loss and death. That consolation, she believed, came in the form of one soul extending to another and saying, I've been there too. And with that purpose in mind, I would like to close by reading my favorite Jane Kenyon poem and one only she could have written, called Happiness. There's just no accounting for happiness or the way it turns up like a prodigal who comes back to the dust at your feet having squandered a fortune far away. And how can you not forgive? You make a feast in honor of what was lost and take from its place the finest garment which you save for an occasion you could not imagine, and you weep night and day to know that you were not abandoned, that happiness saved its most extreme form for you alone. No. Happiness is the uncle you never knew about, who flies a single engine plane onto the grassy landing strip, hitchhikes into town, and inquires at every door until he finds you asleep mid-afternoon as you so often are during the unmerciful hours of your despair. It comes to the monk in his cell. It comes to the woman sweeping the street with a birch broom, to the child whose mother has passed out from drink. It comes to the lover, to the dog chewing a sock, to the pusher, to the basket maker, and to the clerk stacking cans of carrots in the night. It even comes to the boulder in the perpetual shade of pine barrens, to rain falling on the open sea, to the wine glass, weary of holding mine. Thank you.
many of you were familiar with Jane Kenyon's work before tonight? Quite a few, really. Okay, someone have questions? Oh, Annie, yes. Thank you for choosing that as your favorite. I would not have recognized it as being Jane because it was so, so different. Well, it's actually one of the saddest poems about happiness. I think I've ever yes. <laughs> So in that sense, it is her. But you know, you really do have to, you know, her work is so, well, I've used the words quiet and restrained. Um, what's maybe that you're picking up on is different, aside from the fact this poem is longer, is that the imagery is much more elaborate. You know, she has that double image. You know, first it's like the return of the prodigal son. No, it's even more unexpected than that. It's like the uncle you never even knew you had who suddenly turns up at your door. But when you think about it, kind of a sad poem. <laughs> yeah, but it does, it does describe it. You know, she's saying it so unexpected. Yes? Uh, two things. Yeah. Uh, first of all, my mistake. I should have mentioned that Sue Ellen is here tonight part thanks to a grant from the Tulsa County Arts Council. Yes. Oh. Yeah, and I'm on the Arts Council, so I should be shot. <laughs> <laughs> I have a question, too, and that is, um, you were talking about when she she did the translations of Akhmatova's yeah. uh, poem, poetry, but she was having, she had someone giving her literal translations. Did she, did she learn Russian? No, no, no. Um, okay. I have had just a very tiny bit of experience with translation. I found it so difficult, I gave up. But um, I worked with a Chinese poet at uh, Brown University, and there was a, I don't speak Chinese, but, um, there was a guy there on the faculty who would give a literal word for word translation of the Chinese, you know, which is ideograms, sure. which I couldn't begin to read. And then the really hard thing is to turn that into a poem. Really, really hard. And trying to be as true to the original, to that all you have is the literal if you don't speak the language, which most people who translate poetry are not fluent in the language. Really? But they know how to take ordinary literal language and turn it into poetry. I mean, I, if I read Russian and could understand that image that I quoted about the woman take, you know, taking her left glove, right glove and putting it on her left hand because she was so flustered, um, I could maybe appreciate more the brilliance of that translation that I don't have the literal in front of me. But that's the way it usually works. You work from a literal English version of the poem. Yes? Um, I actually have a collection of um, the Russian and the English. Because I studied Russian. Oh, you did? And, um, but I want to go home and see if it's, it's See if it's there. there. But what I noticed in doing that, yeah. I'm not an expert, but you know, I love looking at right. the translation. The Russian, I'd be curious to see, you know, the intermediate the uh, literal. translation. Mm -hmm. yeah. Because what I noticed is in the Russian, it's more concise. Mm -hmm. The imagery is more like a punch, mm -hmm. and in, in the English language, it becomes more, I don't want to say garrulous, but mm -hmm. it's hard. Well, it's right. Hard. It's someone trying to, you know, because they're trying so hard to get at what in, in the native language could be concise, there is that tendency to use more words to try to explain it. And then you're trying to make it sound poetic. And, right. And then She's doing, she's like the third person uh, yeah. doing it, I think. Is that what you're saying? Well, yeah, there's Akhmadova, and then there's Vera Dunham, and then, yeah, Vera yeah, Dunham. The, yeah. Dunham, Dunham. Dunham. Okay. D U N H A M, Vera Sandomirsky Dunham. Mm -hmm. Does it mean, therefore, there is never a definitive translation? Is it, would you say, is there ever? Yes, because yeah. somebody else could come no. and. No, I mean, people, they're still, you know, translating the Odyssey. Right. And <laughs> each one that comes off, and everyone raves about it, and says, this is it, this is the best ever. And then someone else comes along, because there's no end to the interpretations, you know? 
So no, usually there isn't a definitive translation. So just to continue then, mm -hmm. did you think that um, it wasn't she did the translation she saw were too you know too slavish to rhyme and meter. In other words, they were written in rhyme and meter because the originals were in rhyme and meter, and they didn't pay enough attention to the imagery. That was her complaint. Yeah. Okay. Oh, huh. Yeah. Well, that there. It gives you more freedom to use more. Metaphorical. Metaphorical. Exactly. Okay. Well, they're in um, otherwise, and they're also in 100 White Daffodils. I brought my copies of some of my Hall and Kenyon books. They're on the back table if anyone would like to look at them. And there are some books owned by the library, too, which you can check out. Um, any other questions? Yeah, sure. What struck me was when she moved her husband to. Um, New Hampshire. Mm -hmm. New Hampshire. Um, she decided she was going to sit every day and write poetry. And do you think you can write poetry like novelists or other writers where you can just sit down and be inspired every day? Because from what you're saying, from your quotes, mm -hmm. the poetry comes from a place of either inspiration or despair or mm -hmm. whatever. And you don't always have those. You can, um, every day. yeah, you can't sit down and be inspired every day, but you can sit down every day. <laughs> That's what I do. I just sit down. <laughs> <laughs> I don't mean, know, you just put yourself in the place, you know, whether it's at a desk or in front of your computer or whatever, and see what happens. But, you know, you, know, you can't will inspiration. Well, you can be very inspired and write a bad poem, also. <laughs> <laughs> you can write terrible poetry and in high state of inspiration. Yeah. <laughs> yes. Just a quick observation. The author Jane Yolen, who also writes poetry, uh, more for adolescent and younger yeah. people, but she calls it writing the BIC method. And many children misunderstand that for thinking that she means B-I-C, BIC pen. Yeah, she means butt in chair. <laughs> 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 Well, thank you all. Well, thank you.